So <clears throat> this isn't my favorite thing to do, be up here, but a really strange thing happened to me um, when David announced that our next teaching series was going to be about transformation. Uh, for the first time ever, I thought, hmm, maybe I should teach one of those weeks. The minute I had it, I go, whoa, 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 no, no, no. <laughs> but transformation is my wheelhouse. And so I thought, man, I know a thing or two about transformation. So maybe it'd be a good thing if I'd come up here and teach you guys. But that was before Caleb introduced the series and actually showed us the transformation model that we'd be using. And I got to tell you, as it turns out, it wasn't that I had so much to teach you. It's that God had so much to teach me. You know, and I think it'd be really great if every single series, every single one of us was asked to get up here and teach because you'd really get a whole lot more out of it if you did. But, you know, even without teaching this, a lot of you are processing it because a lot of people have come up to me and said, I think God designed this series just for me. And I think if you are suffering loss right now, it's a pretty good guess that you all feel that way. But the truth is, this series is a gift to every single one of us. Because at some point in every given life, there is loss, there is disappointment, and there is death. And only if you're really young, like Shane, <laughs> my guess is that you at some point in your life have experienced the death of something. You know, one of my favorite things about the vineyard is that we do have a theology of suffering. And I know it's biblically based. In fact, David stole my thunder. Oh, no, he did not. Not with that one. <laughs> with this one. And that theology is, has a strong biblical background or backing. I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. You know, I love that we have a theology of suffering, but how do you take heart? How do you find that peace that Jesus has to offer? I always thought that's what was missing, those steps, those practical steps that would actually help us navigate the suffering in a way that actually led to life and transformation. But I got to tell you, I never thought those steps would be found in the way the disciples navigated Jesus' journey to the cross. It's not that the journey hasn't held great importance to me. Of course it has. I'm a believer. I've always been grateful for what Jesus did, for what he was willing to suffer so that we could have salvation if we put our trust in him. But it was a brand new thought to me that this Paschal journey actually held the key to helping all of us process suffering, death, and loss in a way that brings redemption and transformation and new life instead of bitterness and anger and resignation. So I want to say publicly, I'm grateful for this study, and I'm really grateful to the teaching team for putting it together. Because in 1 Peter 2.21, Peter tells us that Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. You know, I read that verse a million times. I love to read through my Bible. But I'm telling you, I never read it and thought there, would, there could be actual steps, not just the way Jesus lived his entire life. And I know his journey is really familiar to all of us. We've seen it all throughout this is this fault? I'm, it's off my ear. <laughs> there we go. I know you all know this. Woo, back off. <laughs> still, I still know. You all know these steps. Passover, Good Friday, Easter, the 40 days, Ascension, and Pentecost. But I don't know that we're all that familiar with how those steps actually translate into our lives, how they give us a journey we can take when we're processing our own suffering. And I think that's actually just as important 
as the steps that Jesus took. Ronald Rollheiser in his book, Holy Longing, says, <clears throat> the Paschal mystery is the secret to life. Ultimately, our happiness depends on properly undergoing it. You know, when I first <clears throat> read this, I was kind of shocked. I thought, man, how did I get to 70 and, and not know the secret of life? Well, I think I lived the secret of life without really knowing it was. I was very fortunate in that. But I do agree with the concept. I think it is really important that we as Christians, Christ's body on earth, figure out how to process our own suffering, loss, and death in a way that is redemptive. It is, at least, if we want to remain kingdom bringers, no matter what life throws at us. So how does the Paschal journey translate into our lives? Again, you've seen this every week of this process. Passover is trouble, Good Friday death, Easter new life. The 40 days is our adjustment period, ascension is letting it go, and then Pentecost is receiving the new spirit. David and Caleb both did a great job of enumerating tons of examples of soft suffering and loss in our lives that have the potential of being redeemed through this process. So I'm not going to go through a million of them. Caleb even asked us to ask God to pick one for us that we could use as we process through this. And I, I know you all did that. I know you do every single invitation, every week. You take those invitations home and you sit down and you do them. So... As I share one of my losses with you, I want you to translate that into whatever loss you're going through or you've chosen to use to process this journey. And I, I'm going to pick a big one. The loss I'm going to share is the loss of my daughter, Shannon, to brain cancer. You know, I wish I'd known these steps when I was trying to survive her death. I don't think they would have sped up the process, but I think they would have given me a lot of hope that there was an end, that if I could just get through it, there would be a new spirit to help me live that new life I'd been given. And it did begin with trouble. You know, I didn't do this step well at all. Caleb encouraged us to stop denying it, stop fighting it, and invite some friends to help us work it out with God. I didn't do any of that. You know, when she started telling me she had severe headaches and pretty acute memory loss, I told her, well, you're 30, and you got four kids. What do you expect? I have this theory that when a baby is in utero, they just suck your brains right, right down. You think it's blood through the placenta? No, it's, it's, the, it's the mother's brains that get sucked. <laughs> so I blew it off. You know, it never dawned on me she could have a brain tumor, ever. In my defense, it only lasted about a month. Her death was sudden. I'm not going to take a lot of time talking about it, Suffice us to say it was sudden, horrific beyond description, and to me it felt like a nuclear bomb had gone off in my life. You know, unlike some of the losses we experience, I couldn't deny it. You know, it was terribly real and utterly devastating. But there is one thing I do want you to hear, and that is that even in this place, even in the f horror that came with her death, even when I was sure God had abandoned me, he was there. He didn't do what I wanted him to do. He didn't heal her. He didn't raise her from the dead. But he was there. There were specific gifts that God provided for me that supplied exactly what I needed to get through it in a way that I knew. I even recognized them in that pain, in that shock, that, oh my gosh, this is God. He is there. 
You know, Jesus tells us in John 5, 17 that he and his Father are always working. I can testify to that truth. They are always working. They are in the not yet just as much as they are in the already. The problem is we're usually too distracted or too distraught or too wrapped up in our own pain to even recognize it. But I'm really glad I did. And I know he was there for me. And the next step is new life. I think this is the trickiest step of all because for us in our suffering, it never feels like new life. I mean, you, you look at Jesus and you know the new life he was given. Man, that was awesome. We can even see that for the disciples. The new life they were given was a good one. But for most of us in our suffering, I can tell you, that new life does not feel good. You know, anytime we think of new, we automatically think that means it's improved that it's better than the life we used to live. And that is not true for suffering, death, and loss. It is new life. But it's new because it's different. It's not the life you had before. You've been given a brand new life. The truth is, I was given a new life the moment Shannon died. I didn't want it. I didn't ask for it, and yet there it was. And I can tell you, I didn't recognize it as new life at the time. It felt way more like death than it did like life. And I think if I hadn't known about this and somebody had come up to me and said, this really is a new life for you, I would have slugged them. <laughs> I would have. Unfortunately, this is where a lot of us get stuck in our process of suffering. We become so consumed with what we have lost and its impact on us that we never come to the place where we recognize the possibilities of the new life that we are, in fact, already living. I remember the exact day that happened to me. A year after Shannon died, Jeff and I went on a trip to Italy. You know, I had my doubts that this was a good idea. I thought, man, we're going to waste all this money because my heart is dead. I spent the last year in acute grieving. When I was home in Missouri, I did as little as possible. I couldn't do anything. I just kind of sat and rested and let my body catch up with what had gone on. Or I went to Texas where I literally wore my grandchildren. They just... We were just a huge lump together. We just moved together. We sat together. And it helped. But we did go to Italy. And the food and the wine and the love of my husband. I hope this is the only place I cry in the whole thing. And the beauty of Tuscany woke up my heart. I can remember it like it was yesterday. I was standing on the front porch of this little villa that we stayed in our second week, and I was looking down at this magnificent valley full of wildflowers, and something in my heart shifted. And for the first time, I knew that this new life actually could be a good one and a meaningful one. And that's the initiation of the adjustment period. In the claiming of my new life, I was initiated into that period of adjusting to the reality of my new life. I love what David said about that last week, that this is where we understand that the mission is still on and we are right where we need to be. And that morning, looking at that valley, I knew it was true, and thankfully I was ready to move on. You know, until you recognize your new life, that you are in fact already living, and claim its possibilities, you'll simply stay stuck in your deaths, in your losses, and in your disappointments. Again, to quote, Ronald Rollheiser from his book, Holy Longing, 
Thus, we have a choice. We can spend the rest of our lives angry, trying to protect ourselves against something that has already happened to us, death and unfairness, or we can grieve our losses, abuses, and deaths, and through that, eventually attain the joy and delights that are in fact possible for us. And they still are. I can tell you that today, they still are. You know, that adjustment period that was initiated in Italy actually began in earnest a few months later when David asked Peggy and I if we'd do a 40 days group that fall. 40 days group, earnestly adjusting. Go figure. Little did I know then that one yes would lead to a small group that would last for 15 years. You know, I remember at one point Peggy said we should make t-shirts that said laugh, no, excuse me, pray, cry, laugh. And uh, Mike Dotson was almost the instigator of those t-shirts because he used to say to Peggy, all you women do is pray and cry and pray and cry. <laughs> and she said, no, we laugh. We, we laugh a lot. You know, the disciples were either really smart or really lucky because they stayed close to each other and close to Jesus during that entire 40 days of their adjustment. And that's what I did too. In this small group, I opened up my heart and my life to these women because I had learned years earlier that the truth wasn't my enemy. And it's not my enemy because the truth is the only place God can enter the story. And when God enters the story, it gets really, really good. And we always did that. Every week, we invited the Father, we invited Jesus, and we invited Holy Spirit to be in our midst. And they always were, powerfully. And slowly but surely, I began to adjust to the realities of my new life. And I even began to embrace it as a good and rich and meaningful life. Which brings us to the last step of this process we're going to look at today, and that's letting go. This is the step I was actually asked to teach about this morning. I'm probably supposed to be finished already. Oops. You know, I find that really ironic and so much, <clears throat> so much like God, because I know when the trouble began. I know when Shannon died. I know the day I recognized my new life and claimed its possibilities. I know what made up my adjustment period. But what I don't know is the exactly when I was finally able to let Shannon's life and death go so I could receive their blessing. I think in that I'm more like the guys on the road to Emmaus. You know, I don't know when it exactly happened, but I can tell that it has when I look back. In some respects, the disciples were fortunate. Jesus physically ascended right before their eyes. They didn't get a choice. I mean, he was just gone. Acts 1, 9 through 11. After he said this, he was taken up right before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, and when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them, Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. I would have loved to have been there. I haven't, I don't, I haven't gotten through the second season of Chosen. I don't know if they get that far yet. But I would really love to have seen the look on the faces of the disciples when you know, Jesus disappeared on them. I mean, did they stand around and go, now what? Or do they get really excited and want to get on with it without Jesus there to guide them? We're not told. We do know they went back to Jerusalem and that they, they gathered and waited for the promised Holy Spirit. We also know that they gathered together. They stayed together in one accord and they prayed. That's all we're told. But my guess is they were also sharing stories of all that they'd seen and all that they heard and experienced when they were with Jesus. We know they prayed, and I imagine there was a lot of laughter. 
Maybe not tears, like in my small group, because we know real men don't cry. There were some women there. They were probably crying, but not the men. <laughs> but there was sorrow. I'm sure there was sorrow expressed for what would no longer be. But mostly, I think they were sharing how much their lives had been enriched and changed by being with Jesus. They knew they weren't the same men they were before Jesus' impact on their lives. I think they were celebrating that fact and maybe even looking forward to what was going to come next. And that is the work of the ascension. This step of truly letting, truly letting go of the life we once lived. We do it first by naming what was good in that old life. And then we receive those blessings with gratitude and we let them go so that we can be blessed by them. You know, unlike Mary at the tomb who was trying to cling to Jesus and to the old life, we have to let it go. But the good news is if we do, we will receive its blessing. You know, after I was, after my daughter, I got to get some water, sorry. After my daughter died, while I was still in Texas, my neighbor called me and she said, Kitty, do you want me to go to your house and take down all the pictures of Shannon off the wall and off the tables? And I thought, good heavens, no. I, I want them all to stay right where they were. But I can tell you, every time I looked at them, all I felt was pain. And I know she was trying to save me from that pain. But I also knew that somehow that pain was honoring what Shannon meant to me in my life. And I'm not sure when it happened, but now when I look at her pictures, I don't feel that pain. I just experience joy and gratitude for what she meant to me in my life, for the, all the joy of raising her and knowing her. You know, I was so young when I had her. I was barely 20 years old. I was terrified of being a mother. But then she was born. And I felt this love immediately with an intensity I never, ever experienced in my life before. And I just knew I can be her mother. And she was such an easy baby. I mean, she slept through the night at six weeks. And I was breastfeeding her, so don't use that as an excuse. <laughs> she was potty trained at 18 months by my mom, not by me. And she gave me so much joy. Her whole life, she was so generous. As a kid, she used to give away her toys to her friends. But then she'd turn to me and go, Mom, we got to go get a new one. I said, <laughs> It doesn't work that way, girl. <laughs> and as a, an adult, she stayed generous. You know, they bought this brand new house in Texas, and while they were up visiting us for a month, she let this family with a bunch of kids and a dog live in that house. Brand, I mean, she'd hardly lived in it herself. And while they were there, their dog ate a hole in the carpet in the living room and Shannon didn't even care. I'm like, who are you? You're, you're not my daughter, but... And she loved big crowds of people. Me, I like a dining room. I like 12 Max. I like my china. I like my crystal. She liked paper plates and hot dogs and 100 people and their kids running all over her house. I thought, whew, they have dirty feet. <laughs> But for her, it was always the more, the merrier. <sighs> she was funny and warm. She was inviting and beautiful. And she loved worshiping God. And I loved watching her worship God. You know, at our first memorial service in Texas, Nancy Wilson, the wife of their vineyard pastor of the church they attended in Michigan, when she was speaking at the memorial, she said, I've been trying to come up with a word that describes Shannon. And I'm, 
you know, sitting there in my shock going, beautiful, captivating, shiny. And Nancy said the word she finally came up with was sticky. And I, <laughs> sticky? What the heck does sticky mean? And she said Shannon always stuck everyone to herself, and then she stuck them to God. And that is the gift of knowing my daughter that I love the best. She was really, really sticky. Today I can honestly say, even despite the little tears, that these memories bless me and make me happy. What used to cause me so much pain now just makes me really grateful that Shannon was in my life. So I know I've let go of her life, and in doing so, I have received its blessing. But what has been so much harder to do is to let go of her death. The idea that I could receive anything good from her death has been extremely hard for me to come to terms with. I even struggled with the title of this series, Getting to Your Best Life. My immediate reaction was, woo, that train left the station the day my daughter died. There, the, my best life is no longer an option. But even in this, I realize that my definition of best life has been informed by the world and the culture that I've been raised in. But when I let go of that worldview and without prejudice, look at how I've been changed as a result of experiencing my daughter's death, I do know some good has come out of it. For instance, I lost a lot of naivete and arrogance. Before Shannon died, um, I was the teaching director of a denomination, large denomination, non-denominational Bible study. And for nine years, I had taught scripture. And I thought I knew a thing or two about God. I also thought that if I sold myself out to him, and if through that sacrifice, tons of women's lives and hearts were transformed, then surely God would take care of me and mine in return. I mean, I never said it out loud, but I really assumed that we, we had a deal. You know, Shannon's death and the sheer shock of losing her caused me to come to the same place Peter did in John 6, 68 and 69. Earlier in the chapter, Jesus had shocked a huge crowd of people by saying, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And after those words, lots of people quit following him, even people who had considered themselves disciples. And after they left, Jesus turns to the twelve and says, do you want to go away? And of course, Peter's the one who answered, and he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And like Peter before me, as I sat in the horror of my stunning grief, I realized that for me, there is absolutely no place else I could go. And I even understood that means I was going to have to learn to trust the God who is, not the God I thought he was, not the God who I wanted him to be, but the God who he is. And I knew even then that it meant I needed to surrender myself and my life to this God that I couldn't control or even manipulate. And yet still believe that the life that he had for me was good. So letting go of her death meant being willing to live in that tension, the tension between the already and the not yet, and living it in a way that I would trust God for the resolution in his time and in his way and not bail out of that tension 
and try to force my own resolution or, or create one of my own. You know, I'm not perfect at this, but I've definitely made progress. So have I let go of Shannon's death? Have I really been able to let it ascend? Today I, I can say yes, I think I have. I've been able to name the good that came out of her death, my experience of her death. I've been able to receive those gifts with some sense of gratitude. But the real proof that I've let it ascend is the blessing I received in its place. Because of her death, I now live my life fully in the reality of eternity. What used to be theological is now experiential and practical. I know I will see my daughter again when I die and when I pass from this life to the next. Shannon always had so much respect for my ability to teach the Bible and to couple that with the power of us telling the truth about ourselves. So whenever I went to Texas, she always wanted me to teach at her church or her friends, wherever and whenever that was possible. But when I finally get to heaven, the tables are going to be turned. She's going to know so much more than me. She's going to get to teach me all of that. And I'm really looking forward to that day. So the worship team can come on up. And this is the invitation. I know you're all going to do. I mean, I think you'll probably start at 1.30. <laughs> so take this some time this week to sit with one of your deaths, your losses, or your disappointments, and see how or if you've progressed through each of these steps from Passover to Pentecost. Then become willing to share where you are in this journey with God and some trusted friends. And then please come back next week ready to embrace the truth that there is a new spirit specifically designed to help you live well in the new life that is already here.